It's a great privilege to uh, introduce uh, our friend and colleague, uh, Dr. John Goh. Uh, Dr. Goh is a professor uh, at the University of Southern California uh, at Keck Medical School. He is the director of head neck imaging and is also uh, working with House Clinic uh, on a regular basis, uh, helping us with our um, imaging study. So uh, John, thank you for giving a formal lecture to us on infection and inflammatory processes of the temporal bone. So thank you for joining us. Uh, Bill, thank you. And thank you for the invite uh, to speak with you guys today. Uh, my topic today is gonna be on infectious and inflammatory processes of the temporal bone. Um, uh, for this, this is going to be a pretty much a review for something that you see probably every day in your practice. So, so what I'd like to do is to review by region inflammatory processes of the temporal bone and to demonstrate the imaging features for each of these um, conditions. So the way I broke this up is I sort of like wanted to go by region. So we're going to basically work with regards to the temporal bone, work our way from the outside and then work our way in. So the first I'd like to talk about is the pinna and EAC. And the infectious and inflammatory processes, uh, of course, would be otitis externa. And we can divide otitis externa into basically acute and chronic otitis externa and uh, separate uh, malignant otitis externa from acute and chronic forms. And to, of course, to talk about cholesteatomas of the EAC. So acute Otitis externa uh, basically is uh, an acute inflammation. Sometimes some people describe this as being swimmer's ear. Uh, typically patients present with ear pain, uh, erythema or swelling, and then um, uh, pain upon motion of uh, tragal motion of, um, if you actually were to move the tragal, the tragus itself or uh, auricular motion tenderness when you tug on the patient's ear. Uh, the different types of organisms that can uh, cause otitis externa include uh, pseudomonas, um, staph, staph infections, fungal infections in patients who are immunocompromised or immunosuppressed, such as uh, Candida or Aspergillus, or you can get a viral otitis externa, such as uh, what you may see in, in Ramsey-Hunt syndrome. So what do we see with uh, acute otitis externa? Uh, typically, you'll see soft tissue thickening within the EAC, uh, periricular inflammatory changes. Uh, you'll see erythema or swelling and on imaging, you'll see skin thickening, straining of the fat, uh, inflammatory soft tissue. Uh, you may even see thickening of the cartilaginous portion of the EAC on imaging. Um, that is gonna be associated with the soft tissue thickening. Here's an example of a patient who has um, uh, an acute otitis externa. You can see marked narrowing of the external auditory canal itself. Normally in the normal condition, you really do not see the soft tissue within the EAC because the skin is so thin here. Um, so remember that this is not mucosal thickening because there's no mucosa within the external uh, auditory canal. And then also you can see that there's, a, that there's actually a chondritis too of the cartilaginous portion of the EAC that's also thickened as well. Um, on CT, typically you will not see uh, bony changes, but again, you'll see this soft tissue thickening uh, here within the, uh, within the EAC itself. And as, as you saw in the prior case, the periricular soft tissue swelling. Uh, normally you would not see in, in a simple otitis externa that you will not see uh, bony changes. You will not see osteolysis or bone erosion. Uh, with chronic otitis externa, when you have multiple episodes of acute otitis externa, you get a periosteal reaction. And so bone gets laid down and then say you have an acute inflammatory event with periostitis um, of the periosteum of the, of the bony EAC. Uh, you lay down bone, the infection resolves, it happens again. Uh, you lay down more bone. And then eventually what happens is that you get concentric narrowing of the uh, external auditory canal. And so the patient could very well present in a chronic setting with marked narrowing of the bony EAC, as, as, as you see in this case, there's another uh, on, also on the other side as well. Uh, another complication that you can get is when you have um, uh, multiple repeat episodes of otitis externa that you, you can begin of having soft tissue filling the uh, external artery canal. And this condition is called uh, chronic stenosing uh, external otitis. It's also called medial meatal fibrosis. 
And normally it presents uh, or looks like a plug when you actually examine the patient otoscopically, you see that there's a soft tissue mass, which basically occludes the medial segment of the uh, external artery canal. In 60% of cases, uh, this is a bilateral condition. You can see that the, there's a soft tissue which appears to fill the medial portion of the bony EAC, and this is bilateral too. It's a fibrous plug. Um, etiologies besides infection include trauma or radiation therapy. Malignotitis externa, uh, you see um, nor in, in diabetics, patients who are immunosuppressed, uh, patients who have been on chemotherapy, uh, and are also immunosuppressed in patients with HIV. The most common organism is Pseudomonas. Um, there's a high mortality rate in patients with malignant otitis externa, for example, in 42% of patients with HIV um, and 4% 4 of patients who are diabetics. In the setting of malignant otitis externa or necrotizing, another name for this is necrotizing otitis externa, the mortality rate is up, excuse me, the, um, the infection spreads inferiorly to the, the terminal mandibular joint or below the skull base. And the reason why is because in these cases, there's a thermal phlebitis uh, of the draining veins of the external auditory canal. They extend through what are called the fissures of Santorini. Um, and then you get a thermal phlebitis that extends inferiorly and the infection goes below the skull base. You can also have superior extension of the infection into the middle cranial fossa. And so you can have intracranial complications such as um, subdural empire, uh, excuse me, uh, epidural empyema, subdural, excuse me, epidural abscess, subdural empyema, or meningoencephalitis. Uh, or you can have skull base involvement and patients can present with cranial neuropathy, osteomyelitis, and sinus thrombosis. Here's an example of otitis, a malignant otitis externa in this patient who's a diabetic. You see what appears to be uh, lots of uh, periauricular soft tissue swelling and basically a phlegmon or soft tissue mass filling the external artery canal. This goes below the level of the EAC into the temporal mandibular joint here on the right side. There's also extension uh, immediately into the middle of your cavity. And notice that you can see the, the, the destructive bony changes here. Another patient, a different patient, malignotitis externa. Um, basically, soft tissue destruction of the mastoid portion of the temporal bone. This has gone into the temporal mandibular joint. Uh, there's a fistulous tract or sinus tract with air. And notice that this has actually gone below the skull base into the uh, prevertebral soft tissues and parapharyngeal space, carotid space, as a very large inflammatory mass. There's even erosions of the uh, anterior occiput. Um, you can see the osteolysis of bone here in this patient who, with malignotitis externa. Klesiotomas can also occur in the external artery canal. This is different from a klesiotoma at the middle of your cavity. 10% of klesiotomas actually do occur in the external artery canal. Here you see a mass of uh, filling the external artery canal here. And you know the hallmark of klesiotomas is bone erosion, bone destruction. Here we see scalloping and erosion of the anterior wall of the EAC. Um, looks basically, could you distinguish this if you didn't see this otoscopically? You know, could you distinguish this from say uh, squamous cell cancer, melanoma, basal cell cancer? I don't think so. But classically, of course, when you look at this, it's a pearly white mass. Um, and that would be a classic appearance for cholesteatoma. Uh, here's a different patient. There's a basic a mass filling and expanding the EAC with erosions of the floor of the EAC, uh, a cholesteatoma. Here's a different patient, another patient with a large cholesteatoma with um, localized um, remodeling of the floor of the EAC, just a destructive change along the anterior wall. Um, another case, Two different, this patient had bilateral uh, EAC cholesteatomas, basically a large mass, uh, erosions along the floor, some residual bone. These are um, residual bone from the external artery canal. From an imaging point of view, of course, as with cholesteatomas, uh, these are, these masses are hypo intense on T1 weighted images, um, bright on T2 weighted images, do not enhance on a post-contrast image. This is the pre and a post-contrast T1-weighted axial image. Uh, how do I know that? If you actually look at the mucosal stripe here, this is the, the mucosa is not enhancing on the non-contrast T1-weighted image. 
in the post contrast image, you can see the enhancing mucosa. So I know that this is the post contrast T1. And notice that the mass that fills the EAC itself does not enhance. On uh, the T2 8 images, it's bright. And this is going to be classic low on T1, bright on T2. No enhancement on a post contrast image. And when you do a diffusion weight image, it's the same location within the EAC. And this mass demonstrates diffusion restriction that would be consistent with a cholesteatoma. There's another condition, which is keratosis obdurans, which um, from, an, from a imaging point of view, you really cannot distinguish uh, keratosis obdurans from a cholesteatoma. Um, it's going to look like a soft tissue bass. You may have some localized bone erosion. Otoscopically, it's going to look like a pearly white mass. But let, let's talk about the difference between keratosis obdurans and cholesteatoma. And they were keratosis obdurans is a condition that was separated from cholesteatoma basically because of the demographics and the appearance of the lesion on imaging. Uh, cholesteatomas are typically unilateral. They occur over the, in patients over the age of 40. Typically patients with an EAC cholesteatoma uh, usually complain of dull, achy pain. Um, and typically with cholesteatomas, you see a lot more bone erosion, bone destruction, and patients may actually have otorrhea. On the other hand, patients with keratosis obdurans, this is a bilateral process. Um, normally the, the age of presentation is under the age of 40. Patients usually complain of really bad, sharp ear pain. And there's actually some localized bone erosion, but there's very little bone erosion compared to what you would see with a with a cholesteatoma, which is which are very destructive, and typically the patients have no otorrhea. So, um, so if you do have again, it's going to be based on the demographics and the clinical presentation um, to to separate the difference between a, a patient with keratosis obdurans and a cholesteatoma. But uh, hopefully, this is going to be a guide for you. Let's go into the middle ear cavity now. Um, we could have acute versus chronic otitis media, uh, cholesteatoma and tympanosclerosis are some of the conditions we're going to talk about now. And what is acute otitis media? Basically, it's an infected effusion within the middle ear cavity. Quite often, you will see effusions in the middle ear cavity, and this is actually normal. It's okay. Um, we normally, and people who are reading MRIs of the temporal bone should not automatically assume that an effusion within the middle ear cavity is infected and should only be raised if the patient actually has clinical, clinical symptomatology suggesting infection. But in the setting of, of an infection, uh, typically it's gonna be bacterial, uh, strep pneumonia and H flu are the two most common organisms, though H flu is not as common as strep. Um, so with a uh, hemophilus infection, it's less common, but there's a higher incidence of meningitis associated with it. Uh, other organisms include protease and pseudomonas. There's other um, organisms uh, causing um, acute otitis media. Mycotic infections or fungal infections are quite unusual, and usually we're not going to talk about that. So from an imaging point of view, what, what do we actually see with a patient with acute otitis media? Again, this is an infected fluid collection. So but uh, you should not see ossicular or bony erosion. On CT, you're gonna see this as fluid within the middle of your cavity with no ossicular or bony erosion. Uh, MR, MR imaging, this will be fluid signal intensity typically. On T-bone weight images, it's gonna be hypo-intense. T2 weight images, it's hyper-intense on T2 weight images. Uh, there's no enhancement and no restricted diffusion. Now, in the setting of an acute otitis media, uh, it can be an exudate as opposed to be a transudate. So uh, it may not be simple fluid signal. Uh, what does that mean? So it may be hypo intense, but not as uh, dark as CSF. And it may, the signal may be altered. Um, so it, it may not be as bright on T2 aid images, but again, it shouldn't enhance and should be no, no diffusion abnormality. Well, how about chronic otitis media? Typically this occurs as an unresolved inflammatory process. Uh, with chronic otitis media, typically you will see, you may see TM perforations are commonly associated with, with attraction pockets. And, you know, seeing a retraction pocket of the tympanic membrane is, is indicative that you're not dealing with an effusion within the middle of your cavity, because if you had an effusion within the middle of your cavity, typically it would cause bowing of the TM, not a retraction pocket. 
So if you do see retraction pockets, that, in, that implies there's a sort of a scarce reaction or granulum just, or basically a scarce reaction causing that tethering of the TM and, and that retraction pocket. Pseudomonas and staph are the most common organisms. And from, you know, in terms of what you actually see, it's granulation tissue. And this tissue is actually vascular or hypervascular. So how do you distinguish acute versus chronic otitis media then uh, from an imaging point of view? Well, uh, remember that in acute otitis media, it's basically fluid with no ossicular bony erosion, so the fluid does not enhance. With chronic otitis media, this is like granulation tissue, and that will enhance. So when you give contrast on MRI, um, you'll see enhancing tissue, and that's also going to help you distinguish between uh, chronic otitis media and a cholesteatoma because cholesteatomas do not enhance, and I showed you examples of the cholesteatomas in the EAC. So can you get bone erosion or ossicular erosions with chronic otitis media? Well, normally you get a bony reaction as opposed to osteolysis. But one interesting point with chronic otitis media is because it's highly vascularized tissue, when you have this highly vascularized tissue, which wraps around, for example, the ossicular chain or the ossicles, the hyperemia from the hypervascular, hypervascularity can cause deossification of the ossicles. And so it can look like you have some type of ossicular disruption when actually the ossicles are actually there, they're just deossified. So in a CT, it might be a little difficult to distinguish between chronic otitis media from cholesteatoma because you might have what you think is ossicular erosion when actually the ossicles are actually there, but the MRI is gonna help you sort it out. So with chronic otitis media, from an imaging point of view, what do we see on CT? Uh, you, you may see fluid or soft tissue in the medial cavity. Again, you might have ossicular erosion or disruption, disruption may be present, but again, that, hy that hypervascularized tissue can cause a deossification of the ossicular chain. On imaging, on MR imaging, on post-contrast images, this should demonstrate uh, enhancement on the post-contrast images. And on diffusion weight images, it should be negative. So I'm going to show you some examples now of chronic otitis media. Here's a uh, patient who had a conductive hearing loss. You see what appears to be debris or soft tissue within the middle ear cavity. It's not really fluid because you really don't see an air fluid level here. Um, and when you follow the ossicles, okay, well, here's the head of the malus. These images are going from uh, superior to inferior. Here's the malleus head, body short positive incus as you go inferiorly. Where's the rest of the incus here? And this is the stapes superstructure, which is here. That's the stapes here. But the long and lenticular process of the incus are missing. And you see what appears to be this soft tissue here. So is there ossicular disruption or is this a form of chronic otitis media? Well, here's the patient's MRI. Um, this is the uh, T1 pre and post contrast T1. Here's a T2 weight image and a diffusion weight image. Now, one of the uh, questions I get asked my residents and fellows is like on a temporal bone study, how do you know where the middle ear cavity is when you are looking at a, um, a temporal bone MR? Well, if you think about the anatomy of the middle ear cavity, here's the cochlea, here's the basal turn, the min apical turn, the cochlear promontory, which forms the base of the cochlea, is the medial border of the middle ear cavity. So if I need to find where the middle ear cavity is in a, on an MRI, all I have to do is find the basal turn of the cochlea and the cochlear promontory should show me directly where the middle ear cavity is because it's gonna be the area lateral, lateral to the basal turn, okay? That should be the middle ear cavity. So this is the middle ear cavity. So the reason I'm showing you this is because you see on this MRI temporal bone, this is pre-contrast T1 and post, there's some material, that's the material that we were seeing uh, in the mesotympanum on that CT. It's sort of ISO intense on T1, but actually enhances on a post-contrast image. So we go to the same location, there's no restricted diffusion. So this would be an example of chronic otitis media. Uh, ISO and T1 enhances on a post. The signal intensity can be variable um, of the material because it is granulation tissue, so it can be bright or it can be intermediate. And sometimes that can be masked, again, because of susceptibility artifact due to bone and air when you're looking at a, um, the, the petrous temporal bone on MR imaging. But again, if you find the 
cochlea itself, here's a basal turn, mid turn, apical turn with fluid within the cochlea. Remember that if you go lateral to the basal turn, that should be the middle ear cavity here. So let's talk about klesiotomas. You see this all the time. Imaging is similar to epidermoid. I showed you examples of EAC um, klesiotomas. Now we're going to talk about middle ear klesiotomas. These will present as a soft tissue mass with a sickler or bony destruction. That's the hallmark of a klesiotoma. From an MR imaging point of view, these are hypo-intense on t one weighted images, hyper-intense on T2-weighted images. Normally, these do not enhance. So klesiotomas do not enhance on a post-contrast image. Now, you may have enhancement of the mucosa around the klesiotoma, but the klesiotoma itself will not enhance, and these lesions will be diffusion positive. Here's an example of a pars flaccid type of klesiotoma. This is the pars flaccid type, or the ones, of course, uh, in Prusak space. Uh, here's the head of the malleus. This is the malleus, head of the malleus, neck, and manubrium here. This is the scutum with destruction of the scutum, and the mass is located lateral to the malleus head. So this, of course, would be a pars flaccid type of klesiotoma. Here's a different patient with a klesiotoma, very large one. You see a mass filling um, the uh, meso epitympanum, extending through an expand additus ad antrum and mastoid antrum. And so this is a very large klesiotoma of the middle ear cavity extending into the mastoid antrum. How about MRI imaging? Well, here's an MRI in the patient with a klesiotoma. Here's a T1 weighted image. Uh, there's a mass, part of it's in the EAC, majority of the mass is actually in the middle ear cavity itself. Here's a cochlea. Remember to go lateral to the cochlea, you should be in the middle of your cavity. This mass is sort of iso intense to muscle signal on T1. Higher up though, it's maybe causing some form of obstruction. This is the epitympanum and expand as that antrum, mastoid antrum. This may be prognaceous material due to obstruction from a mass in the middle of your cavity. This is the T1 weighted image. Here's the post contrast image, same patient. The, that lesion is not enhancing. Now, there is some mucosal enhancement within the middle ear cavity around the periphery of the lesion, but the lesion itself does not enhance. And actually, it goes up into the mastoid antrum. The T2 weight images is bright. So it's ISO in T1, bright in T2. Portions of the lesion, you know, are intermediate to low in signal given some of this is prognaceous material. But here's the diffusion weight image. And here you can see that the mass actually restricts on the diffusion weight image. Um, this is that probably obstructed mastoid antrum, but the middle ear cavity component restricts, and this was a cholesteatoma of the middle ear cavity. Um, another patient, and sometimes it can be difficult to dissect. When you look at a CT and you see what appears to be or soft tissue in the middle ear cavity, uh, is there a cholesteatoma? You see uh, on this cut, here's the head of the malleus, body sharp process of the incus go inferiorly. You see absence of the long and the ticker process of the ink since possibly the state B superstructure. Is this due to chronic otitis media with deossification of the ossicles or is there actually a mass sitting in here that's causing um, destruction? So let's do an MRI then. Here's an MRI, same patient, um, T1 weighted images. This is pre-contrast T1. I know this is pre-contrast because there's no enhancement in the region of the cavernous sinus or within the veins. So this is an, a pre-contrast t weighted sequence. You have material which is iso intense to muscle signal on the t weighted images, some areas of higher signal intensity within the mastoid antrum and expanded uh, additus ad antrum. But here's a, a post-contrast image and you see uh, enhancing material here that's, that's in the middle of your cavity. Again, here's the cochlea, go louder to the cochlea that places me in the middle of your cavity. This is the middle of your cavity. So that material is enhancing. Higher up though, uh, here's the malleus uh, head and the top of the uh, incus. And you can see there's non-enhancing material higher up in the mass, in the mastoid antrum and adus ad antrum. On the T28 images, it's bright. Okay, so it's ISO T1, bright on T2. Uh, remember that the component in the middle of your cavity is the component that enhanced. Uh, here's a diffusion sequence, um, no little harder to see, but this is actually in the epi, that's actually the mastoid antrum, and that's actually a small klesiotoma that was in the mastoid antrum, and the rest of the stuff in the middle of your cavity was chronic otitis media because it enhanced.
So let's talk about tympanal sclerosis now. Uh, this is a sequela of chronic otitis media when you have a uh, chronic infection in your cavity. And these are basically, you get these, what are basically non cholesteatomatous erosions. Uh, you get granulation tissue that as it regresses forms a fibrous calcific or bony um, calcifications that can cause restriction of vesicular motion. So what do we see with tympanal sclerosis? You're gonna see what appears to be heterotopic calcifications in the middle of your cavity. Sometimes it may actually coat the ossicular chain. Some people describe this as a candle wax appearance um, of calcification or ossifications around the ossicles. So let me show you a case of a tympanal sclerosis. Here's a patient who had um, chronic otitis media in the past. Uh, this appears to be a soft tissue within the medial cavity. Uh, this case, there really does not appear to be ossicular erosions here, but there appear to be debris or soft tissue within the middle ear, middle ear cavity on the left. This is the same patient a year later, and you can see that there are now calcifications that are actually in the meso and hypotympanum here. This is the eustachian tube here. Here's the carotid plate, the opening for the eustachian tube, and you have this heterotopic calcification adjacent to the ossicles, and this is an example of tympanal sclerosis. Uh, let's move on from the middle cavity into the mastoids now and talk about um, mastoid airspace disease. Um, basically, it comes in two different forms, acute versus, uh, well, acute and chronic, but uh, acute mastoiditis would be similar to acute otitis media in the sense that, you know, just because you have uh, fluid within the mastoids does not automatically mean that you actually have a mastoiditis. You really have to have uh, clinical signs and symptoms, um, retroauricular pain, edema, swelling, uh, fever, white count, things like that. Otherwise, we'd call it a mastoid effusion. Uh, one of the problems with mastoiditis is that you can have complications from um, mastoid airspace infection. Uh, these are some of the examples of things you can get. Coalescent mastoiditis, so as the infection spreads, you can get osteolitis of the septae within the mastoids, so they coalesce to form larger air cells. And when we see that destruction of the normal mastoid architecture, we automatically do call coalescent mastoiditis when we see that. Uh, you can have abscess formation either within the mastoid as an infected fluid collection with rim enhancement, or if it actually breaks through the um, uh, the cortex, the outer cortex, if it goes laterally, you can have a retroauricular abscess, that would be a basal abscess. It could go superiorly through the tegra mastoidium. You can have an abscess intracranially, as well as like an epidural abscess, subdural empyema, um, meningal cerebritis, for example. Um, if it actually involves the sigmoid plate medially, um, it could actually involve the, the, si the sigmoid sinus or transverse sinus, and you can get sinus thrombosis as complications. Uh, here's a patient with what appears to be an infection. Here you see uh, within the mastoids, there's a pacification of the mastoid air cells, and the pacification of the air cells themselves do not automatically imply uh, acute mastoiditis. But look at the air cell here. You see that there's loss of the normal mastoid architecture. It's coalesced into a larger air cell with a pacification. And you can even see on these bone windows that there is an extensive retroauricular soft tissue mass here. Uh, and there's also cortical breakthrough of the lateral mastoid cortex. So this appears to be an infection, right? That it's broken through and there's a lot of like, basically like a phlegmon in a retroauricular location. Um, this is the same patient. You can see that there's an abscess which is developed below the skull base here. This is actually just adjacent to and anterior to the mastoid tip here. Uh, there's a lot of inflammatory tissue there as well. Um, this is uh, also the same patient. Again, you can see on the soft tissue windows uh, higher up, this is a periauricular region. There's uh, basically inflammatory tissue uh, because of the defect of the mastoid cortex laterally, you even see air, and you can see a fluid collection as a retroauricular abscess here. Um, it is a different patient. There's actually bony destruction. You can see the destruction. Um, again, with coalescent mastoiditis, you have osteolitis of the, the normal mastoid ar architecture and bone erosion, bone destruction. Uh, 
if you if if you have involvement of the sigmoid plate, you could very well actually have um, an epidural abscess or sinus thrombosis uh, associated with the sigmoid sinus. In this case, the sigmoid sinus is actually patent here. Here's a different patient with um, a mastoiditis with abscess. You can see this is uh, adjacent to the pinna, but you see um, the patient has a pacification of the mastoid air cells, and now there's a, there's also this this uh, irregular fluid collection with thick, irregular thick walled enhancement with inflammatory tissue. This is mastoiditis with an abscess. Another type of infection you get was when you have petrous air cells, you can actually have a petrous apocytis. Uh, here you see uh, abnormal signal intensity on T1 weighted images compared to the opposite side on the right side, um, which enhances on a post contrast image. This actually uh, dural involvement as well as involvement of Meckel's cave and cavernous sinus on the left side. Um, these patients may present uh, with a six nerve palsy, uh, that would be Gradenigo syndrome. So a patient with a six nerve palsy with uh, what appears to be enhancement of the petrous apex here. Uh, you can have six nerve problem. Uh, obviously, if it extends into Meckel's cave, for example, like this one does, patients could also present with fifth nerve symptoms as well, and even seventh nerve symptoms, right, because of the uh, facial nerve, which is uh, would be traveling on the floor of the middle cranial fossa. So you could have, for example, five, six, and seventh nerve palsies. Here's another patient with mastoiditis. Um, this is a complicated mastoiditis. Here you see uh, disruption of the lateral cortex. There's an abscess adjacent to the base of the petrous pyramid uh, with extensive soft tissue swelling. But this infection also went through the tegmen the tegumastoidium and went up. And you can see that this is a large brain abscess. There's also a uh, meningitis, there's pecky meningeal enhancement. There's extensive T2 signal changes on, on T2 weight images, this is edema. And notice this fluid collection has a thick capsule to it, which on T2 weighted images is actually very low. Uh, that's usually indicative of an abscess when you actually have hypo-intense signal intensity of the capsule of the collection on the T2 weight images, and it's usually due to deposition from um, uh, free radicals um, is location. But notice that this collection um, on the post-contrast images, um, there's no nodular component, it's thick-walled. And of interest is on diffusion weight images, the fluid collection actually restricts. And that should be, that should actually nail the diagnosis for you that you're dealing with a brain abscess because typically the collections in a brain abscess do restrict on a diffusion weight image. Uh, here's an example of a patient with mastoiditis with sinus thrombosis. As I mentioned, as a complication. If there's actually involvement of the sigmoid plate, um, you could actually have uh, thrombosis of the sigmoid sinus. And so this is a T1 and a T2A image here. And you can see this alteration of signal within the sigmoid and transverse sinus. The material here is actually really bright on T2A on T1 weighted images, um, bright on on the T2 as well. This is actually a um, this is actually a hematoma or clot on MR, and um, typically clots are bright about T1 and T2 weighted images. Here's this proof on an MR venogram that shows that there is thrombosis of the transverse sigmoid sinus and internal jugular vein on this side as a complication of mastoiditis. Um, another condition you get uh, is cholesterol granuloma. This typically is an expansile lesion. The most common location is the petrous apex. Uh, they may occur in the middle of your cavity or within the mastoids. Uh, classically, uh, petrous apex uh, usually as a unilocular lesion, cystic lesion, which is posterior to a horizontal component of the petrous ICA. Uh, typically, these are expansile lesions without bone destruction. As I mentioned, they're typically posterior to the petrous ICA, the horizontal segment. And they're bright about T1 and T2 weight images. This should help you get make the diagnosis when you see a bright lesion about T1 and T2 weight images and no enhancement of these lesions. Here's an example of a cholesterol granuloma. Here's a um, it does probably involve the, the this is the this is the uh, petrous pyramid. It's a unilocular cystic lesion. On MR, though, on T1 and T2 weight images, it's bright on both T1 and T2. It's unilocular, and it doesn't really enhance on a post-contrast image. So this is an example of a cholesterol granuloma. Again, most common location is the petrous apex.
Um, they can occur in the middle ear cavity. Here you see what appears to be, you think that's a pacification of the, of the middle ear cavity, but if you actually look on MR, you see what appears to be this high signal intensity lesion of spread in T1, filling the middle ear cavity, extending down the eustachian tube here on the T1-weighted images. On the T2-weighted images, it's also bright. So it's bright on both T1 and T2. This is pre-contrast, this is post-contrast. I know this is post-contrast because you can see um, contrast related enhancement of the veins as well as the mucosal stripe in the nasal pharynx. I know this is a contrast image and between the two, there's no enhancement of this lesion. This is a cholesterol granuloma of the middle ear cavity. Uh, last part we're gonna talk about is labyrinthitis. This is inf infection inflammation of the inner ear. Uh, there are different types of roots that spread for labyrinthitis, uh, tympanogenic, meningogenic, uh, hematogenous, or post-traumatic. Um, there are different types of agents that can cause labyrinthitis. So it can be bacterial or viral, for example. But, you know, you can have a non-infectious inflammatory condition, such as autoimmune processes, or luetic is actually syphilis, and I don't think we see that anymore. Um, and it can, it can be, either be serous or separative. So it can be just alteration of fluid, but still a transudate, or it can be separative means more um, viscous or an exudate. So we'll show you some examples of labyrinthitis. This is case number one. Um, these are thin section fluid sensitive T2 weight images. Uh, it goes by the name of KISS or Fiesta imaging. Um, and this is really good to look at fluid signal. So when we look at the fluid signal intensity of the otic capsule on the left side, we can see fluid within the cochlea and within the vestibule on the left. But if you look at the right side, there's alteration of the fluid signal intensity. It's actually not normal. And even the fluid within the vestibule is not as bright on the right side as compared to the left side. So there's something going on uh, within the, uh, the fluid signal intensity within the um, uh, the OD capsule on the right side. Now, in this case, and we look uh, to see whether or not it actually enhances, this is the same patient, uh, it doesn't really enhance. And so labyrinthitis does not necessarily have to enhance. And as I mentioned, you know, depends on the quality of the fluid and what type of infection we're talking about. But, uh, you know, I did show you the, here where you have the alteration of the fluid signal intensity. And so it's probably more of an exudate than a transudate. But at this time, we're not seeing enhancement, so it's not enhancing. But this is still labyrinthitis because of the alteration of the fluid signal intensity on the T2-weight images. We're more accustomed to seeing enhancement, you know, of the of the inner ear. And here's a, here's case number two. And this is a patient who has otitis externa, has middle ear cavity inflammation. There's mastoid uh, airspace disease with extension into the um, periauricular region on the right. But I want to direct your attention um, to the inner ear. Here's the, the cochlea vestibule semicircular canals on the pre-contrast T1. This is the post-contrast images, and you can see that there's actually exuberant enhancement uh, within the cochlea itself, as well as within the vestibule and semicircular canals. And there's even extension into the fundal area of the IEC. Um, so this is also a patient, besides having the otitis externa, uh, otitis media mastoiditis also has labyrinthitis too. And this is the same patient, and there's again alteration of signal intensity of the normal fluid signal intensity within the otic capsule. Um, in terms of long-term sequelae, when you have an infection of the uh, labyrinth itself, uh, you can get um, granulation tissue, fibrosis, loss of fluid signal intensity, and then eventually what can happen is that you get calcification or ossification, which can lead to obliteration of the, of the osseous labyrinth. So here's an example of a, of a patient who had labyrinthitis as a child. It was bilateral. Notice that you do not see the cochlea itself here on, a C, on an axial CT. Here's the vestibule. This should be at the level of the cochlea, and here's the cochlea here. And you see it's totally filled in by bone bilaterally. And this is an example of labyrinthitis ossificans uh, due to um, uh, chronic labyrinthitis in the past. And and this is the same patient. And because it's filled in with bone now, you've lost the fluid signal intensity on T2 weight images. So you can see on this T2 weight images that so we can see fluid within the vestibule and within the semicircular canals, we do not see any fluid signal intensity on MR because now it's calcified or ossified. So it's lost of the T2 signal in the otic capsule.
Okay, so we've sort of took a tour. A lot of these conditions you've probably seen. I hope that you you saw this as sort of like an imaging review. But we we basically have gone. We've discussed by region uh, imaging of different types of inflammatory and infectious processes of the temporal bone. Thank you. Hello, my name is Dr. Kevin Peng, neurotologist here at the House Institute. Thank you for watching this video. The House Institute provides free educational videos for hearing health professionals worldwide. To help support videos like these and other educational efforts, please consider donating by clicking the link in the description box below. Your generous support allows us to keep videos like these at no cost for you and others. Thank you.